song. If you have your Bibles, turn with me tonight to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And we all know that Hebrews chapter 11 is known as the faith chapter, right? Uh, if you read the, the, the chapter there, you'll notice that in the very beginning of that chapter that the writer of Hebrews begins to tell us in verse 1 what the meaning of faith is. And he gives us the definition there uh, of what faith is in verse 1. And then he spends the rest of the, the chapter there giving us examples of what real faith looks like. He, uh, and, and as you look through that chapter, you'll see many, many people throughout the, the history of the nation of Israel, those people who lived in the Old Testament times, how they lived out their faith. These were people who didn't just talk about their faith, but they walked out their faith. This is how they, they lived their life was truly by faith. And so that, that's, that's what faith is all about. You know, faith is about action. Faith, faith is about putting feet to, what, to, what, to, to faith, right? And so I found a couple of one-liners here that I know that Brother Casey likes to use these one-liners. I found a couple that kind of kind of fit what I want to talk about tonight. One of them says that faith is acting like God is telling the truth. Faith is acting like God is telling the truth. Another one says that faith is acting like it is so in order that it might be so simply because God said so. Another one says faith, you test faith by feet, not feelings. I heard the story of a young boy many years ago living uh, in a very poor time, living out in the country, and out where he lived at, there wasn't yet indoor plumbing. And so they had an outhouse out in the backyard. And out in their backyard where the outhouse was, there was a creek that flowed right on the property line of their backyard. One day the little boy come home from school. He hated that outhouse. That outhouse was too hot in the summertime. It was too cold in the wintertime, and it was smelly all the time, and he just hated that outhouse. And the more, more than anything that he hated about that outhouse was that his friends at school picked on him about being poor and having to use the bathroom in, a, in an outhouse. And so one day he comes home from school. He'd had a rough day because his friends had been picking on him again about that outhouse. And he goes into the backyard and he just takes that outhouse and he pushes it off into the creek. And he goes inside and he, begin, he goes in his room and he starts to pout. A few hours later, his dad comes in his room and says, Son, come on, we've got to take a trip. We're going out to the woodshed. The boy says, well, Dad, what for? Most of the time when we go to the woodshed, that means I'm fixing to get a whooping. He said, that's right, you are fixing to get a whooping. Because somebody took our outhouse and pushed it off in the creek, and I believe that somebody is you, wasn't it? The little boy said, yes, sir, it was. He said, well, come on, we're going to the woodshed. The little boy said, now, wait a minute. Have you ever heard the story of George Washington? Remember when George Washington was a little kid, and he chopped down that cherry tree? And, and, and he, he was honest with his father when his father asked him, did he chop down the cherry tree? He was honest with his father, and therefore his father didn't punish him for chopping down the cherry tree. Why am I being punished when I was honest with you about pushing the outhouse out into the creek? And the man said, well, let me tell you something, son. George Washington's father wasn't in that cherry tree. <laughs> now, the moral of that story is that our choices have consequences. All of our choices have consequences, and we all know that life is full of choices, right? And we all make big choices. We all make medium choices. We all have minor choices and major choices and everything in between. And we know that all of those choices that we make, they have consequences. And every, every one of us here tonight have been through all three. I don't care how old you are or how young you are, we have all made choices, and we've all had to live with the consequences of those choices. Now, the person that we're going to be looking at in the book of Hebrews tonight is Moses. Now, Moses was a man who knew what it was to make choices. Hebrews, uh, Hebrews tells us, and the Old Testament also tells us, that Moses was the greatest leader that Israel, the nation of Israel, ever had. He was a great leader who led them out of bondage there. And he, just like us, had to make the choice of faith. And if you're going to live by faith, you also are going to have to make a choice. You see, faith is not just going to appear out of nowhere in your life. If you're going to live by faith, you're going to have to make a conscious choice decision a conscious choice that i'm going to live by faith you're going to have to consciously say i'm deciding today that i'm going to live by faith and so the story of moses uh, moses begins uh there in verse 23 of hebrews chapter 11 and here's what it says it says by faith moses when he was born was hidden three months by his parents because they saw that he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command by faith moses when he become of age refused to be called the son of pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. 
esteeming the reproach of God uh, of Christ greater riches than the treasures in, in Egypt. For he looked to the reward by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as, as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Now in verse 23 we are introduced to not only Moses, but we're also introduced to Moses' parents. And even though their names aren't given there, we know that uh, from the Old Testament their, that their names were Amram and Jochebed. And I'll just stop right there by saying I'm jealous of those names back in, the, back in Bible times. I would love to have a name like Amram. I mean, I can just imagine walking down the street and introducing myself as Amram, and this is my wife, Jochebed. I mean, that's, that, that's just kind of cool to me to, to, that I would be able to do that. But, so, but the story of Moses began with a faith decision that his parents had to make. His parents had to make a decision. Were they going to live in fear of the king's command, or were they going to live by faith? You see, because when, when Moses was born, he was born there in the, in the land of Egypt. And at this time, the, the Israelite people were there in bondage. They were there in slavery. And as they had been, uh, had been there for a while, they noticed, the Egyptians noticed that they were multiplying at a very fast rate. And they had gotten so numerous and so great in number that Pharaoh actually began to fear that they were going to outnumber the Egyptians and that one day they would rise up and cause a revolt and take over the land of Egypt. And so the Egyptians and the Pharaoh, he made a command that all the male babies will be put to death at their birth. That is, this, is, this is the time in which Moses was born. Now the Bible says there in verse 23 that Moses' parents weren't afraid of the king's command. It says that they, that they saw Moses and that he was a beautiful baby and so they hid him for three months. Now, when the writer of Hebrews says that he was a beautiful baby, that goes a little deeper than what we're thinking about. Because we all know that, that all mothers think their babies are beautiful, right? You've never seen an ugly baby, have you? That baby could come out with a cone head, two black eyes, and a smooshed down nose, and everybody oohs and ahs about how beautiful the baby is. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about the looks and the appearance of, of, of this baby here. We're actually told... In Acts chapter 7, verse 20, when, it's, when Stephen is addressing the, uh, the, uh, the Jewish leaders and the high priest, he tells us there, he said, At this time Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God. Now what made Moses a beautiful child to his parents wasn't that he looked nice, it was that God had a plan for him. That God had his hand upon Moses. That God had placed a divine stamp and a divine purpose for Moses' life. That's what the Bible is talking about when, he was, when it says that he was a beautiful child child and because of that and because of that that divine purpose that god had for him and because of that they were not going to be intimidated by the king they were not going to be a living fear of the king's command or, and they were not going to uh, bow down to this culture and this king's command during this time of where they were killing these jewish baby boys now can you imagine living during this time being a hebrew being a jew living there in bondage and slavery there in the land of egypt can you imagine having to work all day in, in those harsh conditions that they worked in, and then to find out that your wife was pregnant and that she had a son, and, the, and they came in and they killed that baby. Can you imagine what it was like to live during that oppression and during that time? But Moses' parents didn't let that hinder their faith. They knew that God had a plan and he was in control, and they made a decision. They made a choice that they were going to live by faith and not fear the king's command. Now, that's, this meant that at three months old, they had to kiss their baby goodbye. Can your mothers imagine that? At three months old, a little baby, that you would have to give him away. You see, that, that's, what we're, that's what we're looking at here. Now, I don't think anyone has ever had to do that before. I don't think anyone here has ever had to kiss their baby goodbye at three months old. Now, some of us have and some of us will have. One day, when our, when our children get older and they graduate from high school, we will have to kiss them goodbye when we send them off into a secular culture, when we send them off into a secular college, into a secular world, we will have to kiss them by And it is at that time we will realize that I hope I put something in my daughter or I put something in my son that they can take with them in order to face that world that they're coming in. You see, I believe that one of the sad tragedies of today is that the Moseses of today don't have faith inside of them because they had their mother and father didn't place that inside of them. Their mother and father didn't have faith, or at least they didn't show the faith, and therefore that faith wasn't passed on to the next generation. I believe that's a sad tragedy today, that we're not passing that faith on to the next generation. You see, Moses, you see, God had a plan for Moses' life. But listen, God has a plan for my life. 
God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for my children's life. And God has a, a plan for your children's life. And for me to try to interfere with God's plan for my children's life would be like taking a Sharpie to one of Picasso's masterpieces. I'm not, not going to do anything but mess it up. You see, that, that's what it's like when we try to interfere with God's plan. You see, our, our lives are God's masterpiece. We are His handiwork. That's what the Bible says. And so when we try to interfere with that, we're, no, we're doing nothing but messing it up. And if we're not raising our kids by God's standard, we're trying to mess up God's plan. And in order to mess up God's plan, we have, in order to live by God's plan, we have to raise our kids in faith and raise them in that light. So Moses' parents knew that God had a plan for Moses. God had a plan for Moses' life, and they weren't going to let the culture... They weren't going to let the TV. They weren't going to let social media. They weren't going to let uh, the, the educational system. They weren't going to let their, their peers. Whatever it was, they were not going to allow that to mess up God's plan for Moses' life. Now, I want you to notice how God works when we place our faith in his plan. You see, Moses' parents put Moses in a basket when he was three months old. They got too big to where they couldn't hide him anymore, so uh, Moses' mother made a basket, made an ark. And she placed Moses inside of that basket, inside of that ark, and she placed him there in the bulrushes of the Nile River. And just as luck would have it, and I'm saying that very sarcastically, just as luck would have it, Pharaoh's daughter comes to bathe in just that right place where, no, where Moses was in the Nile River. And she heard the baby crying, and she goes over and she picks up this basket and she opens it up and she sees Moses there lying in that basket. And she had compassion on that little boy. Well, Miriam, Moses' sister, was watching all this take place, and she comes over, and she says, since he's a Hebrew, because she noticed he was a Hebrew because he was circumcised, and so would you like for me to go get a Hebrew mother? So Miriam goes and gets Mo Moses' mother, and she says, look, your son is at the palace, and they're looking for someone to nurse him, to someone to raise him. Why don't you go apply for the job? And she goes to the palace. She gets hired. In other words, she's getting paid now to raise her son in the palace. That's how God works. That's how God, when we, when we choose to live by faith, God places everything else the way it should be. But first of all, we've got to make that choice. We've got to make the choice that we're going to live by faith. Then verses 24 through 26, we're introduced to the, uh, by the words by faith again. It says, by faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now notice verse 25, choosing. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Esteeming the reproach of Christ's greatest, uh, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked to the, the reward. Now I want you to notice in those verses that faith not only chooses God's plan, but it also chooses God's priorities. Verse 24 tells us that when Moses became of age, he was faced with a decision. He was faced with the decision, was he going to continue to live the life that he had been living, a life of comfort, or was he going to lay all that aside and follow God's plan for his life? Now, the book of Acts tells us that he was around 40 years old when this happened, and I can't imagine this, that this was a very easy decision. Here he is faced all of his life. He had lived in the palace. All of his life, he had been raised with a silver spoon in his mouth, living in, the, in Pharaoh's palace there, get, probably getting whatever he wanted, yet the whole time knowing he was a Hebrew. The whole time his mother whispering in his ear, don't forget who you are, son. Don't you forget about the covenant that God has made with our people. Don't you forget about the land that God has given us. And, uh, and yet, on the other hand, he's got uh, Pharaoh's daughter telling him, look, you've got everything you need right here. We've provided everything you'll need. We've given you money. We've given you a job. You've got a Mercedes chariot. You've got everything that you'll ever need. Why would you ever want to leave what you've got here? Yet mom's saying, but you're a Hebrew. You belong to God. Don't you forget that you're a God, that you're God's child. Don't you forget that God has a plan for you. And see, he was straddling the fence. He was straddling the fence. On one hand, he liked being a Hebrew. He liked being called a Hebrew, but on the other hand, he also liked being called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. You see, we got, he's, he's like a lot of Christians today, part-time. You see, they like being called a, called a child of God on Sunday, but yet on Monday they like to be associated with the boys at work. Or what about school, young people, when you go to school? You like, you like being with your youth group on Sunday, but when you go to school, you don't want to be so much of a Christian that your friends don't accept you. You see, that, that's, that's what we see here in the life of Moses. He's straddling the fence. He's going back and forth. But Moses had to make a decision. He had to choose whether he was going to be obedient to God and fully follow God, or was he going to take the easy way and follow what the world would say? 
Now that takes us back to verse 23 again, what I mentioned in the beginning about his parents. As parents, we've got, we need to be imparting things into our children's lives so that when they do get into the world, that would, that would just rather uh, annihilate them, would rather form them into the culture standards than, than for them to live by God. We've got to be placing something inside of them that they can't forget, that they can't get out. And I believe that's where the power of the Word of God comes in. Now, I'm not talking about, uh, per se, having a Bible study with them every night. I'm just talking about, can they see your decisions in your life? Are you, are you living as a parent, raising your children by faith? Are you, are you making your decisions? Are you living according to God's standard? Are you living by faith? That's what I'm talking about because I believe, when, as you've said, you know, that God's Word will not return void. I think about that Scripture a lot. Every time I get up or getting ready to preach or I get ready to teach my Sunday school class, I believe that the Bible says that God's Word will not return void. And I believe that applies to our children as well. We need to put God's Word inside. We need to put God's stamp on and put that divine stamp on so that when they get out into the world and the world begins to whisper in their ear, they've always got that voice inside of them that says, you're a child of God. You know this is not right. You know, you'd be you know better than this. You know you're not supposed to be living that way. That's the, what we need to be imparting to our children each and every day. Because when we get the Word of God inside of them, it's powerful. It won't go away. It won't return void. And when you get that Word of God in them, they'll live the life that they need to live. You see, Moses had not made that full-time commitment yet. In verse 24, look what it says. It says he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. It tells me that he hadn't refused it before. That tells me he liked it. That tells me that he liked having that title, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. You see, sometimes he was a Hebrew, and then sometimes he was the son of of Pharaoh's daughter. Sometimes he was hanging out with the, with the God of his forefathers, but then sometimes he was hanging out with the pagan gods. Sometimes he was straddling the fence. Sometimes he was a Christian on Sunday, but sometimes he was living a, like a pagan out in the world. He was straddling that fence, and God was waiting for him to make that decision. At the age of 40 years old, the Bible tells us that he made the decision not to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. You see, at age 40, Moses had the whole world at his feet. But he made the choice of faith to follow God's plan for his life. You see, for some of us here tonight, God's still waiting on us to make that choice. God's waiting on us to make the choice. Are we going to fully follow, fully follow God's plan for our life? Or are we going to keep playing games at the cross? Are we going to keep playing church games? Or are we going to fully follow God's plan and live by faith the way that he have us to live? But I'm going to tell you something, folks. When you make that decision, it's going to cost you. It's going, to, it's going to cost you. What did, it cost, what did it cost Moses? Well, look at verse 25. It says, Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. You see, when Moses made the decision to follow God wholeheartedly, he knew that he was choosing to suffer affliction. You see, that's not a message that's preached very often, is it? That we will suffer affliction if we, tr if we truly follow after God and follow God's plan. That if we truly want to associate with Him and associate with his, with his people, there will be affliction. You see, Moses was putting his position on the line. Moses was putting his popularity on the line. Moses was putting everything that he had on the line. You see, Moses chose to be affiliated with the slaves, the Hebrew slaves, rather than be associated with the Egyptian princes. He was putting everything he had on the, on the line to be obedient for God's plan for his life. He was choosing to suffer affliction. Not only did he choose to suffer affliction, but it also says that he gave up the passing pleasures of sin. Now, folks, I'm going to be real honest with you. I don't like saying this, especially not in front of our teenagers, but it's a biblical truth that the Bible teaches that there is pleasure in sin for a season. And that's what it says right there. It says that, that, he, that he gave up the passing pleasures of sin. It's a biblical truth that there is pleasure in sin. That's why sin is so addictive. That's why sin is so tempting, because it's fun. For a season. You see, nobody sins out of duty. We sin because it feels good, because we like it. But it only lasts for a season. You see, there's always fun. There's always fun there in, 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 in for a season. But sin, sinful pleasures are temporary. And oftentimes the scars and the wounds that that sin leaves last for all of eternity. Not, all, not for all of eternity, but for all of this life. You see, that, that's, that's the problem with sin that we have in our lives. It's the, it's the scars that it leaves in our life. Can God forgive us for the dumb things that we do when we're younger? Absolutely. But those scars remain, and we have to pay the consequences for those sins for the rest of our lives. So what caused him to make that decision? He had it all before him. He was probably in line to be the next Pharaoh there in Egypt. Why would he give all of that up? 
Nobody wants to suffer. Nobody wants to have affliction in their life. Even Jesus, as he was facing Calvary, prayed, let, God, let this, pass cut for me if it, pass, let this cup pass for me if it be any other way. But see, so many times we make the decision, we don't make the decision for Christ because we don't want to lose the fun. But look at verse, what verse 26 says. It says, Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. In other words, Moses looked at and valued his identification as a Hebrew greater than the treasures of Egypt. Have we done that? Have we done that tonight? Do we treasure who we are in Christ more than the things of this world? You see, that's what Moses did. Moses treasured what he had in Christ, what he had as being a child of God more than he treasured having that, that party crowd, having that sinful life there in that culture that he was, that he was living in. Even though it may mean not getting that promotion or work, even though it may mean not getting that job, even though it may mean that we lose our job, even though it may mean that, that we don't get voted prom queen, or maybe it might mean that we lose that starting job on the team. Whatever it takes, is it worth it to us? Is it worth it to us that we would be more uh, worried about our, identif our identification with Christ than our worldly treasures? You see, for Moses it was. The writer of Hebrews even calls it the reproach of Christ. You see, that's talking about the shame that Christ's name oftentimes carries. That's talking about the shame that sometimes we will face when we carry the name of Christ with us. And then Moses gave all that up for a reason. And it's given to you the last part of that verse. It says, for he looked to the reward. You see, God's not asking you to do something for nothing. God's not asking. God, we're talking about a reward right here. You so you may feel like that you're a loser, and in a sense you are because you may lose your job. You may lose some popularity. You may lose some friends. But is it worth it? You see, that's what he's saying. For he looked to the reward. Now I know some of you are thinking, well, I know that one day when I die or when the rapture takes place, I'll get to heaven and I'll get a reward for all the things that I've done. I don't believe that's what he's talking about right here. I believe he's talking about rewards here on earth. Hey, I believe he's talking about, I don't think he's talking about heaven. Let me tell you what I think what Moses was doing right here. I believe when he was a child and when he was growing up and his mama was whispering in his ear, Moses, let me tell you something. Let me tell you about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let me tell you about the promises that he has made to us as Hebrews, as Jews. He has given us a land. It's called the promised land. He has told us that it is flowing with milk and honey. And let me tell you all about this land. I believe she put all that in his heart. And then at the very last, she said, Moses, and I'll tell you something else. I believe God wants you to lead us there. You see, that's the reward that he was looking to. You say, how do you know that? How do you know that, that Moses thought or Moses knew that he was going to lead them into the promised land? Well, going back to Acts 7 again, verse 25, it says, For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand. You see, he supposed that his brethren knew what he knew. Well, where did he get that knowledge from? How, where did he get the knowledge that, that God was going to deliver his people by his hand? Now, it may have been his mother, it may have been God may have revealed it to him in some other way, but he knew that God was going to use him, and he knew about this promised land that had been promised to his people. Now, I don't know what God's plan is for your life. And you don't know what God's plan is for my life. But don't miss this. Don't miss, don't miss what I'm trying to teach you here tonight. Don't lose God's reward looking for the world's recognition. Don't lose God's reward looking for the world's recognition. Moses was willing to identify with the reproach of Christ even if it cost him everything. And in doing so, he set a great example for faith, of faith for you and I today. So we must choose God's plan. We must use God's priorities, and lastly, we must use God's presence. Look at verse 27. It says, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So by faith, Moses walked away from his old life. That sinful culture that he was raised in, it, it, and, he, and he says that he wasn't afraid of the king, but look at that next phrase. It says that he endured. That means that he hung in there. That means when things didn't go good, he didn't just throw in the towel. That means when things didn't look like they were going his way, he didn't just give up and, and give up on being who he was. That means that he endured, he kept on, kept on. You see, and for 40 years, things didn't look, look good for him. For 40 years, he, and when he was 40 years old, he surrendered. At 40 years old, he made the decision not to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and he was, because he knew that he was supposed to deliver the, the Israelites from the land of Egypt. But for the next 40 years, he didn't lead anything but sheep. He wandered around. Now, part of that was because he killed the Egyptian 
and he was running for his life, but still he was out there and he was just tending sheep. He was enduring. Now the rest of that verse says that he, as seeing him who is invisible. We know that the Bible was without error, right? But that, but that verse doesn't really make a lot of sense, does it? Seeing him that is invisible. How do you see something that you can't see? How do we see something that, that we can't see? Well, it says him. Seeing him that is invisible. That's talking about God. That's talking about God because God is invisible, right? But how did Moses see God? Well, you remember the burning bush, right? The burning bush there for 40 years, Moses is out there leading sheep. He's out there in the wilderness and he's leading those sheep and there's not much going on in his life. He's just out there hanging out. He's just enduring. He's just waiting on a word from God. And then one day he sees that bush burning. I mean, it's burning, but it's not being consumed. It's burning. It's on fire, but the leaves are still green. It's on fire, but the branches aren't, are still intact. It's not being consumed. Now, when you read about this in the book of Exodus, Exodus you'll see that when he sees this burning bush, he says, I must turn aside and go see what that is. And so he turns aside and he gets closer to the bush. And when he gets to the bush, he hears a voice. Moses, Moses, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. He says, Moses, the sandals that are on your feet have got you up too high. I want you to remove your sandals. I want your feet to touch the dirt because you're a creature in front of the Creator. I want you to humble yourself. I want you to humble yourself because I've got a plan for you. I've got a job for you. And that job is I want you to tell Pharaoh, to let my people go. Now watch this. He didn't get a word from God until he had done two things. First off, he didn't hear from God until he had left Egypt. Folks, we can't hear from God when we're still living with the world. When you're still hanging on to the world, you can't expect to hear from God. We've got to let go of the world. We've got to make that decision. We've got to make that choice. If we're going to hear from God, we've got to let go of the world. The second thing was his willingness to endure until it was God's time to speak to him. You see, he was out there for 40 years leading sheep. He was out there, out there just doing whatever it was that he did as he was leading sheep, waiting to hear from God. And let me tell you tonight, if you've left the world and you're enduring and you're waiting on God's timing to speak to you, let me tell you when you're going to hear from God, how you can know when you're hearing from God. When something happens in your life that doesn't make any sense, it just makes no sense at all. There's no way, else, no way else you can explain it except God's doing it. That's when you can get ready and you can know that God is about to speak to you, that God is about to call your name, and he may have a job for you. Then finally in verse 28 it says, By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. It says, By faith he kept the Passover. You see, when God was ready for Pharaoh to let his people go, he told Moses to tell the people, to go kill the lamb, to slaughter the lamb and to eat the lamb and to take the blood of the lamb and to put it on the, out on the doorpost. And that night when the, when the death angel passed over, if he saw the blood there on the doorpost, he would pass over. But if the blood wasn't there, that the firstborn son will be killed in that family. See, that's what it's talking about here when it, when it talks about the, uh, the Passover. Now here again we see two things about faith. First of all, we see that it required action. And second of all, we see that it was something that didn't make sense. You see, this was something that had never been done before. God had never asked them to put blood on the doorpost. It made no sense. Why would God ask us to do that? That's so dumb. Why, why would we do that? I mean, why, why is he saying put blood on the doorpost? It doesn't make any sense because that's the way God works. You see, God wants, to, God wants you to believe what he's saying and then act upon as he was telling the truth. You see, there was only one way to accept to ex, uh, escape the death angel. And that was by the blood on the doorpost. You see, if that blood was applied by faith and in obedience to what God had said, then your family was safe. But I want you to imagine that you're the oldest son in the house. And that night, you saw your dad kill the lamb. And you sat down at the supper table and you ate the lamb. What would be the one thing you would be worried about? You'd be saying, Dad, did you put the blood on the door? Dad, what, you, what did you do with the door? But did, you, did you go outside and put the blood on the door? What if Dad said, well, we ain't got to worry about that. We're all right. We ain't got to worry about that. We believe in God. You see, that's what so many people have done today. They say they believe God, but they haven't acted upon His promises. They haven't acted upon, they haven't placed the blood. They haven't acted in obedience to where God has told them to be. You see, there had to be a willful choice, not just to believe that the blood would save, but, there, but the choice had to be made to apply the blood the way God had commanded it. 
You see, that's where obedience comes in. Faith and obedience, faith and action. Whenever God tells us to do something, that's what He wants us to do. And we will never live according to God's plan until we act upon His promises. So maybe you're here tonight and you never lived, you've never uh, acted upon that, what God has called you to do. But whether it's salvation or whether it's just fully surrendering to Him, you haven't acted upon that. Well, tonight we can do that. We can get that right tonight here as we've heard the Word of God. Whatever God's calling you to do, let's do it. Let's